So good evening, everyone. I would like to welcome you to our December AABIP webinar on behalf of the moderators, Dr. Siwei Lo, Majid Shafiq, and myself. Before formal introductions, we will go through a few housekeeping matters. Everyone, please note that this webinar will be recorded. It, along with previous and future webinars, can be viewed on the AABIP website and can be found under the Education tab on the front page, as shown here. Next, a couple of important disclaimers. So during the webinar, please note that the audience will be muted, so you will not be able to verbally interact with the speaker or audience. However, you can certainly ask questions and communicate with the group during the webinar, which we definitely encourage. All you need to do is type your questions or comments into the chat box or the Q&A function. This can be accessed by clicking on the chat or Q&A icons located on the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. Please make sure that your chat is set to direct to all panelists and attendees so that we, along with the entire audience, may see the question. We will keep track of the questions as they come up and will then address them toward the end of the session in a formal Q&A period, but feel free to type in your questions at any time. We would like to reiterate that the AAPIP does not endorse any specific technologies or products and that the content and views expressed within the webinar represent the opinions of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect those of the AAPIP. So now that we got all of that out of the way, I would like to introduce our topic and speakers tonight. Um, we're very excited to be hosting our second industry-sponsored webinar tonight. We would like to sincerely thank Olympus for sponsoring this webinar. I'm sure many, if not all of us in attendance on this webinar, have an EBISCOPE in our bronchoscopy suite or in our operating room, and we're all familiar with its uh, basic capabilities in the many instances when we should or can use it during a procedure. Uh, one of the more common reasons we use our EBISCOPE, obviously, is for mediastinal staging of lung cancer, uh, which I personally feel is one of the more important things we do as proceduralists. And it's crucial that we are up to date on appropriate staging guidelines and recommendations. So we're very appreciative of the fact that our speakers tonight acknowledge the importance of this and are helping to provide us with this educational opportunity for the December AABIP webinar. We have an excellent panel composed of two very knowledgeable individuals who are kind enough to share some of their time with us tonight to discuss the newest thin EBUS bronchoscope, which many of us are probably not as familiar with and also to provide updates on mediastinal staging in 2023. So our speakers tonight are Dr. Yasufuku, the Director of the Interventional Thoracic Surgery Program at the University of Toronto, and Dr. Roy Cho, an Associate Professor of Medicine and Interventional Pulmonologist at the University of Minnesota. So we're very excited to have both of them here tonight to present on this important topic and for the discussion that will follow. I know they have a lot to present, so I will hand it over to Dr. Yasufuku to start. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, I will try to share my screen now. I'm assuming you're able to see my screen now? Yes. Okay, so um, thank you again for, um, oh, actually, thank you again for the introduction. Um, I'm very happy to uh, talk about um, EBUS DBNA and update on lung cancer invasive mediastinal staging. As, as a disclaimer, what is important, I am a paid consultant to Olympus Corporation of the Americas. I do have other disclosures, which is included on this uh, slide. I do um, several consulting work, but I also do research with uh, various industry. So in the next 20 to 25 minutes, I will try to explain the importance of invasive mediastinal staging. Um, introduce new EBUS equipment and potential benefits, um, identify patients who require complete systematic lymph node staging, um, and review minimally invasive endoscopic systematic node assessment approach for mediastinal staging, and also talk a little bit about the application of ultrasound image analysis during EBUS lymph node staging. Um, 
I believe everyone on this webinar understands the imp importance of in, uh, lymph node staging. Uh, the important thing for us is to identify patients that actually have N0 or N1 or N2 or N3 disease because the survival uh, difference uh, differ according to the pathological N0 stage. Um, as clinicians, we really need to ensure that we can really identify the true um, end disease, uh, since that will guide the therapies for each patient. Um, these are the end descriptors uh, based on the eighth edition of the lung cancer staging guideline. The ninth edition is um, in um, worked on right now. Um, as a exploratory subgrouping, um, N1 disease can be subgrouped to single N1 disease versus multiple N1 disease. And for N2 disease, N2A1, which is a single N2 disease, um, N2A2 is single N2 plus N1 disease, and N2B as multiple N2 disease. N3 is basically the same. And this is really for future validation. And I'm hopeful that for the ninth edition, uh, we would have uh, a detailed subgrouping, which may impact the way that we manage patients. So why is accurate lymph node stage important? It does determine the prognosis and it guides the therapy for our patients. Um, and accurate preoperative staging prevents unnecessary surgical interventions. What we really want to avoid is uh, for surgeons to go in, do surgery, and find that patient has N2 or N3 disease. Um, doing accurate lymph node staging allows comparison amongst different therapeutic groups, um, including non-surgical therapies such as SBRT. We all know that EBUS DBNA has really changed the way that we practice. Uh, the sensitivity of EBUS DBNA for invasive mediastinal staging is very high, with a reported 85 to 96 percent. It has been adopted worldwide, and I, I think it's safe to say that it is the new standard for mediastinal lymph node staging. There are different EBUS DBNA equipment available. Um, the Olympus BF UC180, which is a 180 scope, has been used for many years in combination with the ultrasound processor EUME2. Um, there is a, another EBUS scope from Pentax, uh, which uh, has a, um, a true videoscopic uh, image. Um, and then the Fuji um, system, which has a more a straightforward uh, oblique view uh, with a ultra small um, probe on the tip. So these are the three main uh, systems that are uh, currently available for use in North America and pretty much around the world. The newest addition to this is the new slim convex probe endobronchial ultrasound. Um, and the, the difference of this scope, the 190 series, um, compared to the 180 series is um, included in this slide. So the tip of the ultrasound probe is smaller, um, shorter. Uh, it's 6.6 .6 millimeter compared to 6.9 millimeters. Um, so the rigid uh, portion that sticks out of the scope is shorter and smaller. The other difference of this scope is the, um, the view of the image. Um, there is a slight angulation on the tip. So the previous uh, 180 series, you were looking at a 35 port oblique view. But now you have a more straight view, which is 20 degrees. So um, I think it's much easier to manipulate the scope when you go inside the airway. 
there's also a difference in the um, puncture angle or the angulation of the needle. Um, as you can see on this slide, uh, we believe that this allows the bronchoscopist uh, easier um, tDNA. Um, another difference uh, of the 180 and 190 series is the increased angulation. Um, if you look at this slide, um, the um, shadow here shows the EBUS uh, 180 series with the uh, Olympus 22 gauge needle. You can see that with the newer scope, there's an increased angulation. Um, this is important because with this increased angulation, some of the lymph nodes are easier to biopsy. Uh, this is a good example, uh, station 10R and also station 4L, which is right at the tracheobronchial angle and um, considered you know, a bit of a challenge, especially when you're trying to sample a small lymph node. Um, the 190 series, we believe uh, you get a better angulation. Um, so the insertion angle is steeper, which means that you will be able to place the needle easier. So I think that's one of the um, advantages. Now, um, if you don't do the biopsy, uh, the ebuscope is not very helpful. So you always need to use a needle to do the biopsy of the lymph node. And over the years, um, the different needles have been developed. The original busy shot um, came with a 21 and 22 gauge needle, and uh, Olympus have um, has improved this um, to the Olympus busy shot two, which also comes in a 21 and 22 gauge needle. And the newest addition is the 25 gauge needle. Um, the outer sheath is a little bit different but it's very flexible even compared to the VisiShot 221 and 22 gauge needle. For some reason, if you need a bigger sample, um, there's an option of using a bigger needle, a bigger gauge, 19 gauge needle, uh, which is also very flexible. So these are um, the Olympus um, different needles that you can use um, together with the, the EVASCOPE. Um, the VisiShot 2 needles, 21 and 22 gauge needle, um, are both excellent needles. Personally, I prefer using the 22 gauge needle since there is no significant difference in the size of the sample you can get with uh, 21 and 22. And in general, I think the smaller needle will give you a better quality needle. Um, I personally like the 25 gauge needle a lot. Uh, when you combine the 25 gauge needle with the 190 series, you get a very good angulation. Um, and especially for stations 4L and 10R, where we struggled a lot with the 190 series, um, it, it's now much easier to sample even small lymph nodes in this area. So, um, changing the subject a little bit, um, who requires invasive mediastinal staging? And this really has not changed uh, over the years. Um, based on the CHESS 2013 uh, guideline, there's different uh, types of um, radiographic uh, categories. Uh, group A um, are patients that have mediastinal infiltration. So these patients, uh, you do not require to do, uh, you know, very detailed lymph node staging. But what you need is to, you need to get tissue diagnosis from these patients. Patients in group B, these are patients that have enlarged or discrete mediastinal lymph node. Uh, based on imaging, these patients are suspected, highly suspected have lymph node metastasis, but you do still need to sample these lymph nodes. Um, patients that have clinical stage two or central type stage one tumor, uh, they are also patients that require invasive mediastinal staging. Uh, now group D, which are patients that have a peripheral clinical stage one tumor, 
if the mediastinum um, on CT scan or PET scan does not show any signs of metastatic disease, then these patients usually do not require invasive mediastinal staging. This is the uh, ESTS guideline for mediastinal staging. Um, if you follow this chart, you can identify patients that actually need staging or not staging. Um, you do a CT or a uh, PET CT. If the mediastinal lymph nodes are negative and if they have a peripheral tumor less than three centimeters, typically these patients do not require invasive mediastinal staging. They can go directly to um, the treatment. If, however, they have a clinical N1 lymph node or centrally located tumor or tumors that are larger than three centimeters, uh, you should proceed with invasive mediastinal staging. And based on the ESTS guideline, you should start with EBUS or EUS or um, a mediastinoscopy. And if the lymph nodes are negative, then you can proceed with surgery. However, if the CT and PET CT show that the lymph nodes are very um, suspicious for lymphometastasis, uh, then you need to start out with the endoscopic tissue confirmation. If positive, they will undergo multimodality treatment. Uh, if, however, the lymph nodes are negative on EBUS or US, and if you are really not comfortable with the results, these are the patients that require a mediastinoscopy. So this is the flow that you should go with. Um, and this is um, a combined EBUS and EUS approach um, that um, has been um, published as well. Uh, basically, if you combine EBUS and EUS, um, the yield is higher. Um, so that, that is a recommendation, but if, if com combination is not available, um, EBUS staging alone is also acceptable. And I think the practice in North America is a little bit different compared to the European countries. So to summarize, this is the indications for invasive mediastinal staging, which I will not repeat, but uh, personally, the, this is um, my personal indication in addition to the ACCP and ESDS guidelines. Patients that are really high risk for surgery or patients that are being considered for SBRT or other ablative treatment, I would also consider doing invasive mediastinal staging. And in addition to this, what is new is patients that are being considered for sublobar resection, um, I also would consider doing invasive mediastinal staging. So this is basically my personal indication. Now, what is systematic lymph node staging? Um, systematic lymph node staging requires you to really thoroughly look at the mediastinum in the high limb in a systematic way. You need to look at all the lymph nodes, look at the ultrasound imaging, um, and based on your ultrasound imaging, and the PET scan and CT scan, you need to thoroughly uh, sample the different lymph nodes. So if you have a right-sided tumor, what I typically do is I start out with imaging of the N1 nodes, go into the N2 nodes, and go to the N3 nodes. And once you visualize all the lymph nodes, then you start sampling from the N3 nodes, then to the N2 and the N1 nodes. Just the case, this is a left lower lobe uh, lung cancer adenocarcinoma. You can see this is larger than three centimeters. So indication for invasive mediastinal staging. CT scan did not show any enlarged lymph nodes. PET scan showed uptake in the left lower lobe lung mass, but also some uptake in station seven. Because of the size on, and also due to the PET and CT results, this patient underwent EBUS and um, sampling of station 4Rs, 4L, 7, 10L, and 11L showed that station 7 was positive for metastatic disease. The patient underwent um, neoadjuvant uh, therapy uh, followed by surgery. So basically, you need to really look at everything and sample 
the key and important lymph nodes. This study, which is called the SCORE study, uh, compared systematic and combined endosonographic staging compared to a targeted lymph node sampling. And in this study, uh, systematic EBUS followed by EUS guided biopsy increased the sensitivity for detection of N3 and N2 and N3 disease by 9% uh, compared to just doing a PET CT carded, uh, targeted EBUS alone. So again, the uh, studies like this show you that we really need to do a systematic approach when you sample the lymph nodes. So um, for beginners of EBUS, um, this may not be um, you know, too evident, but for, for people that have been doing EBUS, I think once you start looking at the uh, ultrasound image, you can kind of predict which lymph nodes look normal and which lymph nodes look abnormal. So uh, this is um, a standard EBUS image classification, which we came up um, almost um, 12, 13 years ago, which we published in CHEST. And um, you need to look at the size of the lymph node, the shape of the lymph node, the margin echogenicity, whether the lymph node has central hilar structure or not, and also whether the lymph node has coagulation necrosis sign. When we did the analysis, if you look at the shape margin echogenicity and the absence or presence of coagulation necrosis sign, um, you can pretty much predict a, a patient that has benign lymph node or not. So this does not mean that you cannot, you don't have to sample it, but this will give you a good guide for the clinician when you're doing assessment of lymph node with the endobronchial ultrasound, and it should guide you uh, on which lymph nodes you should sample. Uh, we recently published um, the Canada lymph node score, which looks at um, not all of the uh, EBUS uh, classification that I showed you, but the margin, the central hilar structure, center necrosis, and the diameter. And if you look at these four point score, um, and if you combine the PET scan and the CT scan, um, the sensitivity and specificity is uh, pretty high. So ultrasound features like this will also help you in determining the which, uh, which lymph nodes you should sample when you're doing the staging. So to summarize, um, mediastinal staging determines the prognosis and guides therapy in patients with lung cancer. You do need to properly select patients who require invasive mediastinal staging. Um, a systematic and, if available, a combined endosonographic nodal staging does improve sensitivity of invasive mediastinal staging compared to targeted staging. And combining CT PET and ultrasound features may help identify uh, trip or no more lymph nodes that have a very high negative predictive uh, value for malignancy. So with that, I end my part of the presentation and I will stop sharing and I, I'm happy to answer questions uh, later on. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Yasufuku. I'm going to share my slides. <clears throat> okay. uh, thank you for inviting me for the talk. Um, Dr. Yasufuku, that was a really good um, introduction and background with all of the EPIS and everything you've done. Um, so I'm at the University of Minnesota, associate professor, one of the uh, interventional pulmonary uh, staff here. Uh, I also have a disclaimer. Um, what's relevant to this talk is that I'm a paid consultant for Olympus. Uh, most of my work is through... You can't see your slides, actually. Oh, you can't see? No. Okay, now can you see it? Yes. Okay. 
sorry about that. Uh, so <clears throat> I'm a paid consultant for Olympus. Most of the work is for um, uh, research related to device licensing and also advisory boards. <clears throat> so what I like to do is um, change gears a little bit with the um, the new EBISCOPE, the UC190. So I like to compare it to the 180, um, but really go uh, a deep dive into the ergonomics and how it can, uh, how you feel that it's different to the 180 and how it can help you. Um, I do have a, a clinical case that I'll present and then also um, some of the things that, <clears throat> some of the changes to the 190, how it can help you in your practice and some of the things where I feel like um, it has improved um, certain areas and certain aspects of um, lymph node staging or uh, lesional bi or lesion biopsies in the lung. Um, so we'll go over a few of those things. Uh, to give you a good overview on the specs between the 180 and 190, and I'll just give you some background. Um, at the University of Minnesota, we've used the 190 for years, probably uh, 10, 15 years plus. Um, the 190 we've used in the last year or so. <clears throat> so when we do a comparison, we've really kind of um, shifted gears a little bit because um, I think most of my group, uh, we really do like the 190 and the new needles. So um, a lot of this is kind of focused on on that background. Uh, the channel width is pretty similar so as in addition to the working length. Um, the things I wanna highlight is the direction of view. So like Dr. Yasufuku, uh, mentioned <clears throat> the, the BC, the BFUC 190 has a little bit of, of a more straighter view. Uh, we're all used to the diagnostic scopes and therapeutic scopes, which are, you know, essentially a zero axis, right? So those are more of a straight view. So the newer EBIS scopes are getting closer to that. Um, the depth of field hasn't changed. The outer diameter um, is improved by 0.3 millimeter and the angulation up close to 180 compared to the one uh, the UC 180, and the max angulation down um, is closer to the zero degree. Um, you know, when you first look at these numbers, you know, especially when we were um, approached with the new scope and trying to use it, the numbers seem very, you know, um, not significant, but when you actually use it, um, it's, it's, you can't rely on these tiny little changes in the updated scope. So we'll kind of show you a little bit of what we mean. Uh, the first thing, <laughs> if all of you ha have, you know, experienced the 180, there's two uh, connectors to the processor and the ultrasound. So, you know, it, it was it was very cumbersome with the wires and, you know, having everything kind of on the field. Uh, the, the new 190 is a single connector, so a single port, and I believe that's to the ultrasound. Um, so it's a lot um, sleeker and it's more manageable, especially when you have a lot of scopes here and you have a lot of uh, equipment in, on your field. So that was a, definitely a plus for us. Uh, for the irrigation port and the balloon, we don't use the balloon too much, but the angulation, you can tell from compared to the 180, um, is it's much more geared towards passing the balloon or the brush easier than how it was located before. Before it was a steeper angle. So it's definitely easier to clean, um, easier to use the balloon if, if that's your practice. <clears throat> um, and also to mention, you know, we have these slides from Olympus, but I also cor cor corroborate some of these findings. Um, but some of the mannequin things I have in my lab. So these are pictures that I've taken. So on the left is a, a normal P190 zero degree axis. So this is a typical view that you'll see um, at the larynx, right? So that's the vocal cords. Uh, the old 180, if you look at the top right, you see the, top, the tip of that uh, vocal cord. And then when you get to the 190, you see more of it. So it's, it's definitely, um, more manageable from a drivability standpoint, and the imaging quality, as you can see, is a little bit better. <clears throat> Again, when you compare the 180 to 190, the um, the tip of the ultrasound is only 0.3 millimeter different, but uh, difference with a little bit shorter tip. Um, and then you can see on the right where the where the angulation is also a little bit more straighter on the 190. 
this is another slide I think Dr. Yusuf Fuku had as well. It can show you the different degrees and how much angulation there is up and down. Um, when you look at without a needle, it's a full 160 degrees compared to the 120. Um, and then with a needle, <clears throat> it can get up to 90 degrees and then 105 degrees. Um, uh, I can show you a better uh, example of this on the next slide. So I'll play this for you guys. <clears throat> the one on the right is the 180 and the one on the left is 190. You can tell without a needle, there's definitely a significant um, improvement in the angulation. And I, we'll touch about we'll touch this we'll touch on this a little bit later. But most of this angulation benefit, at least in my practice, is if you're using the scopes through a supraglottic tube or endotracheal tube. A lot of times the tube isn't straight, so sometimes it's angled and it's you know a little bit biased. Where if you have to buy a uh, biopsy 4L and it's angled a little bit to the right, sometimes that extra angulation does help you uh, approximate those areas better. <clears throat> the endoscopic image quality is also something you'll notice uh, is a big improvement from the 180. Um, if you could look at these two pictures, um, I have my own pictures on the next slide, but you can see that this lesion at the six o'clock uh, position is a little bit crisper. So there's more um, uh, fiber bundles um, in the newer scopes and it allows a better visualization. Uh, this is pictures from my lab here. So on the left, this is supposed to be the right upper lobe. Um, the 180, you can tell that the the airways aren't as centered and it's a little bit blurry compared to the 190 on the right. So the image quality is a, is a lot sharper than it was before. <clears throat> uh, the needle orientation that was also mentioned is steeper. And I do agree that when we had the 180, we typically had to position the scope in a way where it was a little bit uh, behind the lesion so we can get a better angle at it. Um, the steeper angle allows you to get a little bit on top of the lesion and then it gets you a little bit more precision at that site. Um, so I can show you on the left what the 180 used to look like or what the 180 does look like. So <clears throat> you can see the angle, it's a little bit of a 45 degree angle, but when you look at the 190, and, and this for us helps out, um, it's a little bit of a steeper angle, but this also helps where you have certain lesions that, you know, maybe necrotic, and you really want to get the peripheral area. So a steeper needle, a steeper angle really does help in those situations. <clears throat> uh, this is the endoscopic image quality. I'm going to press play here. So this is a procedure, um, this is one of our uh, navigation cases where we do uh, bronchoscopy on. As you can see, this is with driving the 190. Uh, we're looking to uh, clean out the airways and then also look at the lymph node stations. But you can see the image quality is actually pretty good. Um, we'll touch base on some of the you know uh, things I think we can use with the 190 scope, but um, the image quality is really good. You can see the airways. You can get into each lobe pretty well. Um, the one of the main things that I felt is a little bit of as a benefit is you are not having to flex up or down on the lever so much to get the angle you want. So with the 190, it's it's from an operator standpoint, it's much more comfortable. You're not really squeezing down, especially when you're trying to get into the upper lobes. So this is the, the ultrasound staging right after we do a cleaning procedure like that or airway exam. Uh, so this is just demonstrates the 180 and 190 uh, angulation uh, with a 21 gauge busy shot needle. So the 190 is on the left. Um, you can see um, just comparing, you know, the 180 and 190 the footprint is, a, is much improved. It's a, it's a smaller, um, it takes up less space in the airway when you look at the, the two images on the left. Um, and in the middle, when you look at the actual, the space where it gets to certain uh, lymph node stations, and then when you actually uh, flex up or flex down, it gets a lot closer to the airway wall. 
this is the busy shot too with the 25 uh, uh, gauge needle using the 190. Um, on the left is the 21 gauge and on the right is the 25 gauge. So it's, it's a more flexible needle, which is why I get more, uh, more you maximize that angulation and gets closer to the airway. Um, I also do prefer the 25 gauge needle as well. Um, I've, I've had, I haven't used it as much with the 180, but with the 190, um, it's definitely more flexible and there's less resistance when you're in a more acute angle to the scope. Um, and I think the biopsy qualities are as good as the 21 and 22 gauge needles. <clears throat> so this is a clinical case um, with a patient uh, who had a, a left lower lobe uh, nodule. Uh, it's in the uh, segment number nine. So typically in our practice, what we do is we set these cases up for navigation in addition to EBIS. Um, but with these newer scopes, you know, you, you know, we get to these, these segmental areas a little bit easier than we did with the 180. So a lot of times what we do is um, we try to see if we can find it with the EBIS scope before we even um, uh, say that we're going to use the navigation systems and open up the tools. So what we do is we intubate with, um, with the endotracheal tube, and then we are pretty much geared for navigation, but we try the EBIS scope first. <clears throat> and you can see the drivability um, on that lower corner. So we're driving to that left side. And we're driving down, we're past the left main, going all the way down to segment nine. And we're trying to visualize the lesion. <clears throat> and you come into focus right there. And with the the new, you know, the where the where the camera is located, um, I feel like the driving is almost as good as a diagnostoscope. It's, it won't be as good as a diagnostoscope, but you can actually see where you're going, and you're not really, you know, uh, guessing or going into multiple different airways. So we got this, you know, pretty quickly. Uh, we didn't have to do the navigation procedure. Um, essentially, it's kind of a one-stop shop, right? So we biopsy the nodule, and then we do the staging. Um, so we always do staging, even though the PET scan doesn't show um, any, you know, mediastinal hilar uh, uh, FDG avidity. Uh, we still do that as a um, as part of our practice. Um, so this is a 4L that we're getting. Um, <clears throat> it's a little bit over five millimeters, but uh, we're able to get it, and with the 25 gauge needle, um, pretty easy compared to, you know, sometimes when it's difficult to use the 180. <clears throat> so one-stop shop scope, um, I think there's a couple ways to look at it like uh, as a one-stop shop scope. So I think philosophically, you know, I really like the way the uh, EBIS scopes, um, the technology where it's headed is getting smaller. It's allowing us to reach places um, easier. Um, just like this segment nine lesion, we got it with the EBIS scope and then we're able to do staging. And we didn't have to use any other medical devices. Um, the other thing too is, you know, as the cameras get better and as the handling gets better, um, you can really use this almost like a diagnostic scope. So a lot of it is really how um, the technology is um, uh, going forth um, in, in the upcoming years. Uh, drivability, um, the shaft of the scope is actually the same size, but it's the tip that's a little bit shorter and the angulation is better. And given the new camera angle, um, drivability is actually really, really, really uh, uh, good compared to the 180. Um, I put GI there because our endoscopists also use our EBIS scope sometimes when there's stenosis in the esophagus, and they really like using the 190 because it's smaller as well. Um, Improved access to difficult to reach targets. So nodules we discussed 4L. Uh, you know, technically, if the lesion is big enough and if it's possible enough in in uh, station 13, um, you can get it if these scopes are you know uh, more um, uh, designed well when they're smaller and, and better angled, that you can get to reach these uh, these uh, more distal lesions. All right, with that, I think we can take questions. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Cho and Dr. Yasufuku.
uh, for joining us today and educating us more about this exciting evolution of uh, this uh, really a staple, right, a workhorse for the bronchoscopist, for the advanced bronchoscopist, interventional pulmonologist. And thanks to everybody for joining. And please continue to um, add your questions to the Q&A section or in the chat box. Um, I'll start taking some questions. You know, first, uh, one of the questions we have is about, uh, you know, any challenges related to using the balloon. I know, Dr. Cho, you had mentioned that you don't particularly use the balloon. Um, Dr. Yasufuku, I was wondering if you have experience using the balloon with the new uh, 190 scope and if there's any challenges, any pitfalls? Thank you. So um, as a rule, I always use the balloon, um, except, except for patients that have latex allergy, because I think you get a better image. Um, that's the reason why we added the balloon when we developed this um, almost 20 years ago. But anyways, um, I, I think there is um, a difference in the size of the tip of the ultrasound um, probe. So um, I, I think our nurses have found that uh, it might be a little bit um, more difficult to get a, a nice seal until you get used to it. Um, but definitely, um, you know, it will not leak if you put it at, you put the balloon on properly. I think it's just because it's a little bit smaller and the balloon is the same, um, it may be a slightly a challenge at first. That's really helpful to know. Thanks for sharing that. Um, and in terms of the ergonomics of using the scope, given where you, you know, I don't know if you use the balloon, sort of uh, the syringe is directly attached to your scope, or do you like to have a little um, extension tubing to go with that? I, I do the extension tubing. Okay. And I assume that because of that, you don't really have much of a difference in your ergonomics as a result. Yeah, that's correct for me. Great. Thank you. Both of you spoke about the 25 gauge EBUS needle um, as your preferred. Uh, please correct me if I got that wrong. One of the questions asks about any specific situations in which you continue to personally use the 19 gauge or for that matter, the 21 or 22 gauge. Roy, you want to go first? I, I can comment after you. Yeah. Um, and I, I'm going to speak carefully because I know Dr. Yusufuku uh, engine, um, <laughs> developed, uh, helped develop some of these needles. But uh, I, I would say our practice is we, our default is the 22 gauge needle. Um, but in certain, um, if, the, if, the, if the angulation is such where there's a, we hit a lot of resistance, um, I'll use the 25 gauge needle. Um, there's almost never a time that I use the 19 gauge needle. So maybe I can comment as well. Um, my standard is 22 gauge. Um, and if we are sampling, um, you know, smaller lymph nodes, I, I do like to use the 25 gauge needle better. And if the lymph node, when you're doing the ultrasound, imaging and if you see a lot of you know vascularity within the lymph node um i i always use the 25 gauge um without suction in terms of 19 gauge um again you know i i was helping out with this development but um i don't use it very often thank you and since dr yasubuku you brought up suction and we have the privilege of having you here I have to ask you, uh, what's your usual practice vis-a-vis -vis suction? And perhaps you can touch upon style it use as well as of uh, December 2023. Sure. So, again, there's a reason for everything. And um, when when I started doing the EBUS, you know, before this was on sale, um, I noticed that I would get a lot of uh, airway epithelium when we were using a prototype needle without the stylet. And we quickly recognize by adding the stylet, you can actually clear out a lot of the airway debris. And that increased our yield about 15%. And that's why the final product came comes with the stylet. This is the you know original visit shot that we developed. So um, there is a reason for everything. And that's the reason why the stylet is there. So um, most of the time, 
you should use the stylet. Um, there might be one study showing that it may not make much of a difference, but there is no uh, solid evidence to prove that. So the stylet um, I always use. And in terms of the suction, I think it depends on the lymph node that you're sampling. Um, and um, the standard is using suction. But if if a lymph node, you know, is very vascular, um, I usually do not use suction. Um, and especially for the subcranial lymph node, because there's a, a you know, a lot of uh, flow from the bronchial artery, um, I would uh, not use suction if the lymph node is very large and very vascular. So that's that's my practice. Thank you so much. Very insightful. And on the subject of improving the diagnostic performance of EBUS, one of the attendees has asked the question about elastography. If either of you would like to comment on how useful that is as of today. Well, you want to take your I can comment first. Uh, yeah, we don't we don't really use it, so okay, uh, I can comment. comment on it. So elastography, it's a it's a you know technology that's been used for many years, so it's not really new to the endobronchial ultrasound, um, and basically it looks at the tissue stiffness, um, and there is somewhat of a correlation between metastatic lymph nodes to um, you know the lymph nodes being stiff. Um, but it's only looking at the sniff stiffness. So you can't just use the ultrasound elastography data to determine if a lymph node is metastatic or not. However, it does, it, it is very helpful when you are dealing with patients, for instance, with sarcoidosis and you, you are trying to figure out which needle am I going to use. So I always use the elastography. I look at the st stiffness of the tissue, and based on the stiffness, I will change the type of needle that I would like to use. So I, I think that's the way I typically use elastography. Um, and there are newer um, ultrasound imaging analysis still not available. If you're interested, you can PubMed with my name, you'll see some uh, publications on the topic. Um, so that's kind of to be seen in the future. But in terms of the elastography, I, I think for um, sarcoidosis, I think it is helpful. Thank you. Looking forward to these exciting developments um, so we can help patients even better. Um, one of the um, Attendees has talked about how they had some issues initially sort of setting the optimal gain uh, setting. And if there are any uh, tips and tricks, any personal experiences, any words of caution, any of you would like to share in terms of how to go about getting the optimal setting for gain in, in terms of uh, optimizing needle visualization on the UC190. You want to comment, Roy? Yeah, you know, so I think in the beginning, we had issues. I, I think a lot of it was we were just so used to the 180, um, and we were used to how, how to handle the 180 and where the needle is and, and things like that. So I think it's just some some getting used to um, the 190, especially with the angulation, um, because a lot of times you can still see that uh, – I, I had a case last week where you can actually still see the needle, but get a good ultrasound image. Um, so, so it's not like the 180 where you need to be fully approximated and have no bronchoscopic image and you get, and you just look at the ultrasound. So there's a little bit of, um, nuances there that I think, um, the more you do, you'll get more comfortable with it. Um, the gain issue, I, I have had some in the beginning where it was a little bit bright and I had to turn it down a little bit. Um, outside of those issues, I think the more you uh, the more you use it, I think you will start to develop a feel for it. And maybe, maybe I can comment in terms of the gain. It you know whether it's a 180 or 190, it doesn't really matter, and it depends on the patient, and also depends on the thickness of the airway. Um, and if the patient has a very thick cartilage and thick airway, obviously you're going to have difficulties 
uh, finding and, and seeing the lymph node clearly. So you need to adjust. There, there is no one, you know, one answer to this. You, you just have to adjust the images so that you can see the lymph node better. And when you look at the tip of the 180 versus 190 ultrasound, you might think that there is a difference in terms of the field of view or the ultrasound image. And we've done a lot of preclinical, you know, during the development, there is really no, not much of a difference in the ultrasound imaging. I think the ultrasound imaging is actually even better. Um, so that, that's, that's my comment. And in terms of the gain, you just have to adjust according to the patient, I think. Thank you. Thank you very much. You know, um, two questions about using uh, adjuncts that we're all sort of, uh, you know, familiar to varying degrees with. Um, you know, Core DX, quote unquote, of course, is a specific product uh, developed by one of the other uh, companies that are in the EBUS field. And then there are other similar products too that are designed at you know making aimed at getting more tissue um, and then similarly cryo biopsy of course has been performed using eva's guidance as well um, what are your thoughts each of you uh, compared to of course this you know the current standard of care and also with the newer ebus uh, scope in hand gonna go first right sure um <clears throat> it, it, it's good to have all the tools, <laughs> um, regardless of the 180, 190. It's, it's good to have everything you know at your disposal, uh, depending on what you need. Um, I think for us, you know, if if we're looking for core biopsies um, and we're not getting, let's say, from your you know from a eyeball view that you're not getting enough tissue. Uh, we would use the core DX forceps or the, the cryoprobe forceps. So I think um, those have a place, um, but I think the needles, you know, will, it'll always be here, right? So I think I think doing the needle uh, sampling first and then using those as, you know, we label them as adjunct um, is probably the way to go. I, I'm not sure um, the techniques have been um well studied in terms of you know what is the optimal way to use these tools with these scopes um and then i think once you know further data like that come out you know maybe we can think about those things a little bit more up front but i think for right now um i use the needles first then use those as adjunct tools i i have kind of the similar comment i don't use the cryoprobe um the cordiax you know, the samples are very small and I would only use it when you're really struggling um, to get tissue or if you really need to call the specimen a core or tissue for clinical trials. That's the only time I would use the core DX. And, and to be honest, if you have a very fibrotic lymph node, the core DX has not been really helpful. It's not as good as um, you know, the regular needles. Um, the Francine type needles are good in certain situations. Um, I think, you know, the key message I would have is, you know, use the needle and get good at it. Because, you know, if you just using the needle, your yield is going to be very good if you know how to use it. And, you know, if you do it in the right way before going to the adjunct tools and spending a lot of money because it's going to be added cost um, for the hospital. You may not think about it that much, but um, I have some administrative role as well. And for administration, cost is an issue. Um, so that's something that I, I would think about. I And I, I don't think adding these adjunct device is actually going to change the yield of um, lung cancer staging at all. Thank you. you know, it's been such a pleasure and uh, privilege hearing from uh, both of you. We do have one last question that I thought I would um, 
you know, save for the last. It's a bigger, bigger problem, uh, but, uh, you know, very insightful question. Uh, one of the attendees spoke about how, you know, both of you spoke about the, um, particularly Dr. Yasupupu, as you were taking us through, um, you know, optimal staging methods, right? The potential adjunct importance of EUS as well. But the reality is in North America, at least, uh, most pulmonologists are not getting EUS training. Um, how do you anticipate this joint endoscopic approach would get integrated into clinical practice, or is there something we should be doing? Do you have any thoughts about that subject? Um, you know, I get those questions a lot, and I, I think it, it becomes a, a challenge, I think, in in the U.S. when you're not trained to go through the esophagus, and if you, you know, perforate an esophagus, you're going to you're going to struggle because you you cannot defend yourself. So I think that's why you need proper training. So if you do wish to incorporate the U.S. piece, I, I think anyone, everyone should do formal training. Um, that That's my opinion. And in Europe, they do get the GI training as well. That's why they're more comfortable doing this procedure, I think. Um, I think with the you know, improvement in the equipment. Um, it's now easier to sample even challenging lymph nodes. So maybe the, um, you know, use of USB may not be as much as before, except for lymph nodes that you cannot sample with the NEVA scope, you know, like the Adreno or Station 8 or 9. Dr. Cho, do you have anything to add to that? Um, yeah, I think, you know, just train, you know, I've trained here in the United States. So um, it's very rare, especially for, you know, interventional pulmonary trainees and fellowships uh, to get EUS training. Um, you know, I just say here that we've done EUSB, right? So that's, that's the scope of esophagus, right? So typically a lot of it is... Um, difficult to see, you know, paraortic nodes or something like that. But I think, you know, with this, with this uh, new scope, you can, um, it gets you in a better position in the airway to maybe uh, get a better window into, into some of these things. But um, I think it's a, you know, it's a topic of debate. Um, I do think that, um, you know, especially in our practice here at the University of Minnesota, we, we do combined cases with GI. So the goal is that one of us is going to get it. <laughs> um, so, you know, as much as we like to do it all, you know, I, I would probably try to, you know, bring in your colleagues as well who are going to do more than you ever will be. I agree with that. All right. That's very insightful. And of course, it's all about ultimately teaming up according to one's uh, you know, institutional strengths, availabilities to serve the patient to the best of our ability. Well, thank you so much. Uh, once again, I'm gonna hand it back to Audra now to take us through the remainder of the slides. Thank you to our speakers again for taking the time to speak with us tonight. It was definitely a very excellent talk uh, filled with a lot of important information uh, for us. We know how busy each of you are, so we acknowledge and appreciate the time it took for you all to put this presentation together and to spend this time with us tonight. We certainly want to say thank you to Olympus as well, our sponsor for this webinar. Um, this topic is applicable to many of us that take care of patients with thoracic malignancies in a variety of different roles, and it, it was really nice to get additional information about this scope and its capabilities as well. Uh, I do want to remind everyone that the recording for this webinar will be available on the AABIP website soon and should also be available on the AABIP YouTube channel. So make sure you let others know that they can check it out if they were unable to attend tonight. I want to thank everyone who took time to join our webinar tonight. You know, in addition to the speakers, we hope you can join our future webinars and other endeavors from the AABIP. And we'd also like to remind you, if you're not already a member, then please consider joining so you can take advantage of all of the other things that AABIP has to offer. And lastly, we hope you can join us for our upcoming webinars. Uh, the date of our next webinar should be finalized and announced soon, so please be on the lookout for that. So thank you again, everyone, and we'll see you at our next webinar. Thank you. Thank you.